been a while, man. Yo, dude, you keep it going, man. People are loving it. Folks, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show and on a divine journey today and uh, a beautiful cat I got a chance to interview today, a dear friend of the program, born and raised in the city of brotherly love, one of the best guitarists I've ever heard, Bobby Rose, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Oh, thank you, Jake. It's such a, an honor to have you today at my... Yeah, bless you, brother. All right. Thank you. Can you, can you talk about... Um, why you still love to be alive? Well, there's there's a lot to love. First, first uh, thing, my greatest love, besides the guitar, is my uh, wife, Lucy. She's been a companion to me since 1962. We've been, you know, we separated just a couple of years. Uh, course of my career I have sure how'd you guys meet uh, I was playing at a club in, in Jersey um, you remember the name of it Lou um, <laughs> it, it was, was it an organ trio kind of thing or what were you, were you uh, what kind of no kind of... it was a quartet it was a guitar bass drums and tenor yeah we had a nice little group uh, talking about 1960, 62. And I was working on a club in Margate, New Jersey. In Margate? Yeah. Really? I'm yeah. down on the shore there. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember the name of the club. I'm sure it was, everybody knew this place. All the college kids used to go there and, and party. Bobby, let me ask you something. What What was it like when you were coming up? Was a musician considered... A profession not really really yeah. so were you paying were you did you play for free I mean because I think one of the crises now with music now is that it's unquantifiable and so therefore a lot of owners feel like you can pay to play or you can play for the door but you don't necessarily get compensated right. but were you were you compensated maybe you weren't you never became yeah. filthy rich but what, what, being between eight and sixteen dollars <laughs> At the time, was a tremendous amount of money. Yeah, I guess so. But you, what, what was your intentions for getting into music, Bobby? Oh, wow. Um, People are loving this, by the way. You look right in the camera, right? Wow, it's hard to say. I just fell into it. I mean, uh, going back to my childhood, uh, the neighborhood was full of people that could sing or play a guitar or some instrument and they always came over to my house 
and they would jam, you know, a couple, almost all the time. And um, that's what got me started. My father taught me how to play the banjo, okay. Uh, and he got me in the, the, in the string band. I was like about nine years old, I guess. And we, uh, we paraded up Broad Street. <laughs> We're right on Broad Street right now, man. I, yeah. I freaking love it, man. Play, uh, play. Just for the record, someone's asking, in a string band, what was the instrumentation in the string band? Wow. All, uh, guitars, banjos, back then banjos, a lot of banjos, a lot of sax players, drums. Maybe horns and strings, know. horns and wind, wind instrument and strings. Wind instruments, yeah, that was just mostly saxophone and maybe a, a trombone here and there, you know. Was it at that time that you fell in love with Django Reinhardt? Yes. Can you talk about, it wasn't, what was it about the rhythm accompaniment with him that, that made you fall in love with that stuff? I... I just was in awe when every time I heard these these two guys play, uh, his rhythms were. I can't explain it. It lifted you. You know, what I mean, if you had any kind of love for music or even just enjoyed it, when you hear these guys play, it just lifts you. It's it's just a different experience. From any other music you would hear, uh, the rhythm player was a monster. You know, he, he played some unbelievable stuff, and and that, that's what got me motivated into falling into that realm of being a rhythm player. You know, I wanted to to do some different stuff from what was out there at the time. But I just wasn't hooking up with the right guitar player until I met Pat. I want you to tell the audience about, uh, if, I, I'm, if I remember correctly, when you met Pat in that cubbyhole in New Jersey uh -huh. during that set break, he's like, I don't know if I'm going to be living at my home much anymore, but you can always find me at Pat's Cheesesteaks. Right. So you found Pat at, the, you went to Pat's Cheesesteaks and you found him there. Yes. And then um, he called you on Thanksgiving one year and said, I want you to come over and have dinner with Jerry and I and hang out. Right. Can you talk about, because the, the relationship between a lead guitar player and a rhythm guitar player is very personal. And what I think is very cool about you guys is that you spent a lot of time talking mm -hmm. before you ever even picked oh, up yeah. a guitar. Yeah. And can you talk about yeah. just the relationship that you and Pat developed even before the musical conversation began? Sure. Lou, can I have some water, please? Yeah. Um, Bobby, you're doing great. People are having a ball while watching uh, it, yeah. My mouth, I'm so dry from Well, I just want to say, that we're talking to an individual who is, the angels have been looking down on this, this man, and he is still here, and it's such an honor to be able to chronicle uh, this individual's uh, career and life, um, because a lot of his peers are no longer here. Mm. So, can you talk a little bit about a conversation that you and Pat would have? Wow. That's good one. Um, Cause he used a lot of vocabulary would make your head spin, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Pat was, my vocabulary was <laughs> nothing compared to him at the time. Cause he was so well schooled, you know what I mean? He studied with the, with the best in Philadelphia. And there I am just a little old guy from South Philly from a string band, you know, so. Uh, well, don't, but he told you, he said, don't, he said, Bobby, don't put yourself down. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah, he said, you can, you're holding your own here. He built my confidence up. I never thought much of myself as a musician because I couldn't read. You know, I was born with, I was dyslexic. Couldn't retain the, what it takes to, uh, to be able to read music. And I look at, I get confused with every, anything on paper, you know? Some of the best musicians I know are dyslexic. Mm -hmm. How did you work through that? 
Just through, just through ear? Yeah, just my ear. I, if it didn't sound right, do something else. You know what I mean? Like it, trial and error was my whole thing. But when you you were you were so in awe of Pat that you did not. Um, I didn't want to play. With you him. didn't even want to play with him, right? No. I mean, you, you, you when what was the turning point? When did you decide to actually engage with the apparatus? He forced me to play. He forced you to yeah. he forced you to play. Yep. Yeah. I'm not, you know, like uh, threatening me or anything, but he just was, he's so good with words. <laughs> he, um, he, he gave me the confidence that I needed because I felt like so far below him, you know, as a musician. So finally he got me to play. And he would just, you know, give me um, uh, some riff to play. And then he would join in, and that's what started, you know, something simple. I forget what it was. But uh, over time, when you get more confidence, did you begin to start coming up with the the riff, and then he yes. would melodically play over that? Yes. Yes. How do you build that trust with another musician, Bobby? For younger cats who are going to watch this in fifty years, I just want you to talk a little bit about. Building that, building that, well, you got people coming to see the, the interview here. The, can you talk a little bit about um, trust on the bandstand? Trust? On the bandstand. bandstand. Well, I sort of like would hang off of whatever Pat was playing, and I would try to um, enhance whatever he was done, doing. You would bounce off each other. He would, he would play a lick that would inspire me to do something, and I would play something that would inspire him to go to a different place. So, um, uh, no, just so let's be clear. That's in, in a duo setting, that's fine. But when you got into an ensemble setting, how did it change? Like when you were working in a quartet or a quintet, and you were functioning as a, as, as were you just yeah, there? Lead and rhythm, yeah. Were you were you channeling more like Freddie Green at that point, like just trying to be a, a rhythm, like like hold it down, or were you actually kind of playing your own little colors? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think the way you say it sounds right. I just somehow would fit in, you know, and uh, I got to be a better. Uh, soloist through that, you know, f from Pat pushing me along, uh, I started to be more of a lead player than I was rhythm. And uh, a lot of bands and musicians would call me for gigs after they found out I was playing with Pat. I was getting all kind of work, you know. And I just got better and better at it. So by the time... 1977 came around. Well, no, 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 no. It's 1968. I was... I was in a different place then. We were listening to... Uh, Indian music. Yeah. Ravi Shankar. Yeah. Right? You listen to Ravi and a lot of the, the polyrhythm stuff. And one night we just sat around talking about it. And we were both inspired and said, look, Let's try. I think Pat said, "Let's let's let's do let's intertwine Eastern and Western music." So I started playing something, you know. So when he said that, it's just he gives you a theme, like a a concept, and then you're yeah. you're off playing some kind of gypsy, right. whatever thematic kind of thing. Right. It was a chord uh, progression. Progression. And next thing you know, Baina comes out of that. Where love's a grown-up god. Right. I mean, I, Israfel. I mean, it's Israfel. It, it's just so weird because my, my dear friend, uh, my friend Evan Cressman, I was in uh, with him last night in Brooklyn, and he's like, "What's your favorite Richard Davis album?" And I thought about it. I said, "It's ba it's Baina." <laughs> but Bobby, I mean, you talk about that session, uh, Bala Krishna at RCA Studios. He lit, he lit some incense, mm. and then the tambora, he started to play the tambora, mm -hmm. 
But were there any any chord charts for that, or was that completely off the top of your head? Oh, I knew what I was going to do. I I had a little structure uh, set up for each, uh, each each piece. I knew where I knew where it was going to go, and 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 went from there. You know, I mean, I, I just. We put something together for each piece, and then we built on it. You know, it was all—it was magical. I swear, that's the only thing I can, uh, to, uh, way I can describe it. A lot of stuff just came off the top of our heads, you know. Well, I, and then Charlie Persip was actually playing a traditional drum set mm -hmm. with that as well, which is just so. So he, Pat actually told the concept of blending Eastern and Western music. That was something that. When you after you guys had spent some time playing together, that was his concept of right. what he wanted to do. Yeah, when we started listening to Ravi, uh, it, it, he, he inspired us to go that way. You know, we started thinking uh, about uh, Indian music, uh, their intervals, the way they played. You know, using quarter tones and all that. It just put us in another place for a while. Once we got Baina recorded, it was like a woman having a baby. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be clear, we're not women. We don't know exactly what child labor is about, but that, that is, was, yeah, it was, the birth was intense. Right. Yeah, Baina came out of that. Um, it was so intense. I can't tell you, but there, as it was happening, I, it just, uh, I was taken, you know, by the surroundings. We, we were, we had a little, uh, the tambour player had his own little rug, his own little area with a light, the incense, and it was set up. And the recording studio was very, very large. And he would set up these, um, what do you call them? Uh, Baffles? Yeah, yeah, around us, around us. So you couldn't necessarily see the other musicians. You were kind of in your own little cubby hole there. No, I could see. Okay. I could see. I could see. Uh, the drummer was sort of like. Bert Persip was. They didn't want any leakage coming right, out of that, right? Right. right. Do you, do you do you remember how much? I mean, back in the day in the studio. I mean, you you did a lot of studio work too. Mm -hmm. Um. How much did the musicians have control, creative control of the music itself? And because, and sometimes I don't want to paint with broad brushes, but sometimes you today in today's world you have producers or in, you know people that really are not. It's outside of their capacity, but they're getting involved with the actual process of the music, the creation of the music. And I just wonder back then if how much creative control the musicians actually had in creating their own music. Whether you know the idea was you know. Nobody was interested in making a hit with Baina. There was no, there wasn't right. going to be any radio hit, right. right? Right. Pat was already established at that point. Right. But was was that when you came in as an accompanist in any setting, not just with Pat? How much creative control did the musicians truly have in making the music? Hmm. Good question. Let me give you an example, like. Uh, Gary Burton was on a date with Steve Swallow. Steve Swallow I've interviewed a couple times, you know. Swallow had his own tune for the date, okay, but it was in like 69. So they were, it was like, you know, uh, Joel Dorn from Atlantic was was running the session and Arif Mardin was arranging. And, you know, it was a situation where Steve came in with a abstract jazz tune. But jazz was sort of fleeting a little bit in popularity at that point. Mm -hmm. Joel's main concern was creating hits, Right. Uh, and Arif as well. And so, you know, jazz, they were trying to find stuff that was going to be radio friendly. Okay. And so basically what happened was Arif came in and started telling Steve how he wanted his tune to be played. Mm. Okay. Steve got very upset and uh, the session didn't go very well and it kind of blew up. Uh, All right. Even though it wasn't his date. And I'm just trying to figure out like whether it was Diodato. Or whether it was um, 
whoever it was, how much control the musicians had? Uh, it, uh, it depends on who the producer was, the leader, his attitude towards the guys he, uh, uh, he chose to do the album with, you know. Like Baina, like, was that all just... The... That was just a pet project that we had. We didn't, wasn't sure it would work. We didn't know until we got to the studio and started playing. We didn't know. That's the magic of music right there. Right. We had no idea it would turn out like that, you know. Cuscuna um, was involved with it? Yes, yeah. And he lived around here too. Michael, Mike Cuscuna. Uh, I haven't seen him in years, about since, since then. Is he still around, Mike? He's still cooking away. I don't know if he's in Philadelphia, but he used to go over to Pat's house and listen to... Oh. Indian music all the time as all well. The time. Right. How do you think that as a rhythm player, how 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 did your development as a rhythm player enhance your 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 lead guitar playing when you be, when you when you learn to improvise? A lot of cats today they come up with. There's so much information out there today. Mm. In the past, you'd have you know records to listen to. Mm. Maybe you'd catch something on the radio, but you couldn't really hit the rewind button. Um, you were you were autodidacts in some ways, but now people come up learning chops, facility before rhythm. So there's not there's some cats that don't have a lot of good time. But how did your rhythm learning rhythm help bring out your your improvisation and your ability to solo? Uh, wow, I I, I I don't know. Do, I don't have the words to beautiful to tell you beautiful how it happened. It's it's magic <laughs> again. Well, I guess maybe maybe the better question is how did you say how did you learn to say what you needed to say without going on forever and repeating phrases? Like I mean, your your solos are always to the point. It's I can't I can't stay in one place. You know what I mean? I I I, I don't I don't uh, I can't dwell in repetition. I need to. I have a need to go somewhere else all the time. You know, I can't stay in one spot <clears throat> too long. I'm here, did my thing, and I want to move on. You know, every band or what do you call it, I played with was the same way. Uh, I went through bands and oh, a bunch of them since then, and my real pleasure was playing rhythm for Pat. That was my greatest pleasure. Uh, it was, I had a freedom, man, like you don't get with, with, uh, with a lot of uh, musicians, you know? Pat allowed me to do and go anywhere with the music, and he would be right behind me or I would be behind him. We just clicked. It was, I, I don't know how to describe it. I love it. it. No, the dwelling on repetition is not something, but I mean, you're, you're telling me that there were certain bands, nobody really had a problem with you jumping around or were there sometimes band leaders that would say, Oh yeah. You know, Bobby, you're, you're getting too free. You're yeah. Come back. Yeah. Yeah. I've walked out on a few gigs. I'm not, uh, <laughs> proud to say well i mean you know <laughs> you know you have your I, own i have my own point of pride yeah right and uh, i can't let someone uh, dictate to me how i should play you know i want to be i i want to i want to be free to do what i want to do uh without spoiling the the basic structure that they they set up you know what I mean? I just embellish it. That's right. all. That, 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 exactly. That's but, exactly but right. Some of them didn't appreciate what I was doing, so. Well, they they were just a little bit too controlling, I think. You know, yeah. of the actual yeah. process. How yeah. how how? Can you talk to younger cats about? You didn't you didn't come through the ac the academy. You didn't you weren't academically trained musically. So. How do you figure? How do you figure it out, Bobby? Jesus, wow. 
I mean, what's a, what's a template for a younger cat today who wants to just develop their own individual sound? Well, I would say do a lot of listening at first. And, and what would they listen? What should they listen to? A variety of music, anywhere from rock and roll to classic. Forget uh, rap and all that other stuff. You know, just rock and roll, classic standard stuff, you know, uh, different eras of jazz. You could see how it grew, how bebop turned around into, you know, freestyle playing. And that's a lot of it's going on right now. They're finally, guys want to do things that are like uh, outside the box. It's finally getting there. I don't play anymore, but I, I, when I get a chance, I listen to uh, the jazz radio. Yeah. And I'm hearing some young guys that they're, they're in the right direction. They just have to stick with it, keep, take the guitar with you everywhere. I even took mine to the bathroom. I could put a bathroom without it. Uh, I'd sound sick, I know. No, you were that you were just horny to play. I mean, it's yeah. Sleep, and you know what else? I everything was with the guitar. I could, I was so in love with the instrument. It it just it overwhelms me. You know what I mean? When I when I pick it up, I feel like I'm in an ocean. You know, of course it is. It's an ocean uh, of possibilities around you. You know. And you, you, there's no chart, you just go. I just go, you know. I want you to talk, you know who I had a chance to interview uh, a couple times is uh, the drummer Harold Jones, who was, who was uh, Basie's drummer, and, and he's right. currently Tony Bennett's drummer, but he played drums on the <laughs> album that had the most influence on you, which was Exodus to Jazz, hmm. Eddie Harris. Ah, yeah. He played drums on that. And mm. Joe Diorio was the was the guitar player on that. Joe, did you know Joe? We talked to each other frequently. I want you to talk about him because he because what Harold said was make no mistake that was the first million dollar million selling record at, that was the most popular record a jazz record of all time, and a lot of people don't think that, but it it, yeah. it was the most highest selling. I think it was sold the. It was the first jazz record that sold a million copies. You talk about Exodus to Jazz, right? That's right. That, Joe DiOrio blew me away on that. What was he doing on there? Because a lot of cats are not hip to that record. Oh, please, whatever you do, get that record and listen to Joe. Joe's the most sensitive guitar player. Um, and he's, he has his own style. Uh, I, I could pick Joe out f from anybody. Um, yeah, uh, Joe and I keep in touch with each other frequently. Still? Yes, yeah, still. I need to get a hold of his number, dude. I got to interview that cat. I, I have it. I can fix you up with his number. Let me ask you, for what is it, what is your legacy? And what is Pat's legacy? Here we have two warriors from Philadelphia, from the city of brotherly love, um, still burning inside, still with a zest for life, not necessarily with the ability to play music all the time. You get older in life, you know, it's... It, what is the love supreme for Bobby Rose? What is your legacy, Bobby? Wow. I, I, I just want to live now. You, you know, like... I, a music will always be a part of my life, but I, the guitar, me playing, uh, it's now, we're now past it. I went, I took it to where it had to go, and it's over for me now. Now I, I could sit back and relax and enjoy uh, music uh, I'm no longer a part of, but I still enjoy uh, listening. Uh, my 
my ability to play left me. And that was not evident at the beginning. You were you were you were you were cooking at that. Uh, All right. I guess the point is, what does it mean to live now? When you say, "I just want to live," I want to live. See, when some, when you go to a doctor out of nowhere and tells you you have one year to live, my whole life changed at that at that moment. You're just thinking, "Well, what am I going to do?" You know. In this year, my last year. Um, when did they tell you that? Lou, do you remember? Uh, 2014. F 15, was 14. it? 2014, yeah. yeah. So you're way beyond that yeah. prognostication. Yeah. Yes. But see, <clears throat> I never fully recovered between that and the accident. That, that really put me down. <clears throat> and it's been wow, years since I picked up a guitar. You know, you know like uh, the, the what's incredible. I is, feel yeah. like I don't do it any justice by playing now. Well, well, because yeah, you. I mean, you're not you uh, not yeah. where you were before. Right. You know, I mean, right. it's it's uh, it's right. it's humbling. It's but frustrating. Did you? Can you talk about like learning to bleed? The calluses that you need to develop in your hands, like that—that's one of the keys to being a legitimately spiritual player. You have to bleed. West Montgomery bled. Pat bled. You bled. You developed those calluses. Yeah, it's painful. It's painful. Very painful. I mean, you were on the bandstand bleeding, like like. No, no. I was. I don't remember bleeding when I was doing something alive. Well, mostly at home, you know, I would uh, extend myself, you know, overextend myself to that point. Uh, yeah, I had, a, I had a pretty bloody affair with the guitar. You had a very bloody affair with the guitar. <laughs> Did you play the original Birdland? No. That's one gig... I looked forward to doing, but never had a chance to do it. How did that not happen? I don't. It seems like it would have been right in your Any, wheelhouse. Anybody I worked with wasn't doing. Whenever they did New York, it was somewhere else, like the Metropole. The Metropole, absolutely. The living room. The. Uh, uh, it was like like uh, like. In uh, the village, there's a couple. Of places the Vanguard was there, but right. also I mean. Village uh, Vanguard. And the place up in the on the Smalls Paradise. Uh -huh. Did you play up there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, how much of it? Who was you know like? There's one cat right now, Kenny Burrell. All right now, Ken, oh. Kenny is Kenny is is not has 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 also had some serious health problems. You're not going to believe this, wow. but his medical bills are so astronomical that he's facing losing his home. What is it? What is the? What is your message for future people that want to pursue music as a profession? Don't do it if you if you can't um, if you're not materialistic. Fine, because you'll never get rich. <laughs> Play, you know, box. Okay. You want to be uh, you want to be an individualist. Uh, it's it's hard, especially I don't know how it is out there today. You know, it's been so many years. Uh, there's a new breed of musicians out there. I don't know what their attitudes are like. You know, like uh, things change. And so it's hard for me to say. Just like I said. Blow your own horn, man. That's all I can Blow say. Blow your own horn. Blow your own horn. Don't be afraid to to do make a mistake. You can turn mistakes around. How did you learn to how did you learn that? Uh, just by doing it. Yeah, but I mean like was that the USO band? Was that when did you learn that there were no wrong notes? Well, a while ago. A while ago. Around I'd say before, before uh, I, I was on the the, the Baena album, 
I was doing a lot of experimental work, and uh, I think I did one thing with the uh, with a, a piano, keyboard player, uh, Galaxy, and that was that 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 was freeze bird. Then you know I was right up my alley. It was there were no restrictions. Uh, the name was, of the album was Galaxy. Yeah, yeah. the album Galaxy. Uh, it, there was no time signature. Right. No key, and there was no structures. You, everything was like on the spot. And uh, yeah, it was very experimental. Who was the leader, Charlie Erland or someone like that? No, 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 it's just uh, Ron Thomas and I. Ron, okay, Ron Thomas and you, that's right, right, right. Galaxy. Um, you know, uh, I've got to send you an album of that. Uh, no, I want absolutely. I mean, the what keeps you alive today? My wife's love. She makes me do the right thing. Uh, take my medicine away, because <laughs> uh, I I'm, I neglect myself. You know, I forget this. I just forget this. It's so much. To do, you know, what uh, take uh, this at a certain time, take that at another time. Uh, it's a lot to keep track of, you know. And uh, thank God for Lucy; she, she kept me alive for all, all, all these years. So I got to give her the credit. That's beautiful. That's true love. That's a soulmate. It's 20, 49 years we've been married. So. And uh, she, things never changed. She loves me as much now as she did back then. And uh, I feel the same about her. She still worries about me all the time. Uh, she's a wonderful woman, uh, just cares about everyone, you know. But she, she took good care of me. I, I have to give her the credit for me being, being alive today. Because, uh, like I said, I neglect my own uh, sure. health. Too many peppers on those cheesesteaks. Mm. Can you, um, before we go, uh, just play something for Pat and you? It's, it's, I don't care what it is. I, this, is people are, this is an inspiring thing for everybody around the world to see. I, oh, man. You want to know? I'm, I'm so... My chops are so bad, I just feel... Uh, you don't feel bad, Bobby. I'm embarrassed to, to, to play the guitar because... Uh, so look in the... Tell me... The, give a message to Pat right now. Look into the camera and give a message to Pat. Pat, I love you. Always will. Uh, you're my main inspiration. Um, and, I, and I feel... Uh, so privileged that you were in my life. Um, you, you helped me in so many ways. And uh, I, I, I hope uh, your, your illness, I hope you can overcome this illness and get back to, to your old self again, because you still can play your ass off. Without a doubt. Better than ever before. Better than ever. And you, so can you, Bobby. And I want to tell you, thank you for playing that intro, man. That was one of the most beautiful, heartfelt oh renditions. Like you said, there were mistakes and flubs, but it's all good, man. Because, you know, we're all going to get be there someday. Wow. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. I, you, had, I, I have no complaints. No complaints. I feel I've been lucky. I've been very lucky to be in to be associated with the people in my life. Uh, Lucy, Pat, my parents, they're, everybody's gone now. All my parents, all my old family's gone. There's nobody left. Uh, all I have is Lucy and my son, John. That's my family now, you know. Much love to you, Bobby. Thank you for being here, man. It was uh, really a ball, man. 
Jake, I love you. You're a great guy, and uh, I'll, I'll never forget you. Of course, we live so many... Well, we'll be together yeah, again, all right? Good. Much okay. love to you, brother, and uh, thank you for being part of the program. Thank you so much. We'll be back later with Wavy Gravy on The Jake Feinberg Show.